Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, anyone who's planning to sit down, if you could do so now, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, welcome to this function, uh, this book launch for this uh, wonderful new book by Margaret Cameron Ash. I'm Scott Hargraves, Executive General Manager at the IPA, uh, standing in for John Roscombe, who couldn't make it today, unfortunately. Uh, but it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful room and uh, to express uh, our joy at seeing so many uh, familiar faces and some new ones two years since our last IPA uh, function of this kind in Melbourne. So maybe we should just mark that little, little milestone. Uh, uh, we've all managed to uh, keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, in particular a few uh, of the IPA people, the, some directors, our chairman Jeff Hone is in the audience and also uh, Leslie Gillespie serving on the board of the IPA. There's uh, many, many IPA staff as you would expect in the room and afterwards, uh, after the conclusion of the, the talks, we'll be uh, going back out, uh, we can have another drink and you can meet some of those IPA staff and have a chat. Um, Gideon Rosner, I think, will be familiar to you from Sky TV and uh, also the gossip column in the Financial Review. Gideon was recently married, so uh, <laughs> congratulations to Gideon. Uh, wonderful woman and, uh, and a wonderful event it was too. And of, of course, uh, Bella will be speaking, Andy's here, Rachel Guy, uh, and uh, Chetna Mahadik, I think, is... Uh, is here uh, familiar for from doing IPA this week, our uh, regular Thursday email. Uh, it's also a special occasion because we're here uh, to recognise a book uh, which is published by uh, Quadrant, another wonderful book from Quadrant Publishing. Uh, leading the discussion will be Nick Cater from the Menzies Research Centre, so we have a, a trifecta of freedom-loving organisations uh, in front of an audience full of freedom-loving people. Uh, there are a lot of IPA members here, so many in fact that we're not going to overdo the calls to join the IPA. If you're not, you're very welcome to, but uh, we're going to try something a little bit different. You, you'll see uh, on the way out that we do have, uh, I might call them show bags or gift bags. Rachel's got one uh, holding up for anyone who can twist their neck 180 degrees, but it's essentially a gift pack for friends and family that you can give or we'll have an IPA review, which I edit by the way, it's very good, uh, member news and some other IPA publications and stickers and so on. And you can give that to your friends and say it's time you actually stepped up to join the IPA. Uh, also, of course, after we've had the, uh, the talks, uh, you've, if you haven't already, you've got an opportunity to purchase the book at the special price of $39.95. And uh, Margaret, I don't know if you're warned, but uh, I mean, we're expecting that you'll be able to sign those books for anyone who's happy to um, purchase one. And uh, you can have a small, quick chat to Margaret while that's happening. I'm sure there'll be a great demand for what is a wonderful book. Uh, that's all I have to do for the moment. I'll be coming back up uh, when at the end of the discussion. Uh, Nick will actually be introducing uh, the other speakers. Uh, so Nick Cater, Executive Director of the MRC, please come to the stage. Thank you, Scott, and, uh, and thank you, everybody, for attending. It is really, truly wonderful to be back talking to people face to face again. Um, it's, uh, it's been a long couple of years, as you know, but. Uh, as uh, I did last week, uh, uh, to, I got the loudest cheer of the night at an event when I declared that the COVID-19 is officially over. It's gone. We're finished. We're done with it. Uh, thank you. And look, thank you. This is, this is as Scott said, a trifecta of uh, great uh, organisations come together to organise this event. Quadrant, the publishers of Margaret Cameron Ash's mar marvellous book, uh, Beating France to Botany Bay. Um, the, the IPA, of course, that stalwart of, of uh, solid thinking here in Melbourne and around the country, and uh, the Menzies Research Centre, uh, a much smaller organisation, but we like to think uh, quite active um, as well. And if, you, uh, if you're not on our mailing list, if, you're not if you don't receive our water cooler news every Saturday morning in your inbox, 
uh, then uh, please see me afterwards or go to our website menziesrc.org and sign up for it because um, you can't get too much good good solid content these days because there's not much of it in the mainstream media as you know so <laughs> please uh, you'd be most welcome to join us uh, in the in the in the in our um, it, it, with the water cooler news. So anyway, to tonight's event, look, welcome to this special discussion, um, which we're recording live here before uh, a maskless audience, which is quite wonderful. Uh, my name's Nick Cater, as, as Scott introduced me, and my name's Nick Cater, Executive Director of the Mendes Research Centre, and I'll be hosting the conversation uh, with, jointly with our friends at Quadrant and the IPA. The legitimacy of, of Australian settlement uh, a European settlement in Australia is under concerted attack, motivated by an ideological, convi ideological conviction that colonialism is bad in all its forms. Missing from this critique is any serious reference to the facts. Indeed, much of the history of early settlement these days that is taught in our schools is out and out fiction. Well, today we're joined by two guests to try and get closer to the truth about, the mod about modern Australia's foundation and, and to argue why accuracy and objectivity matter in the teaching of history in our schools. Later, we'll be hearing from Bella Debrera, the director of the Foundation of Western Civilization Program at the IPA, who has a history in BA and Spanish, has, who has a BA in history and Spanish from Monash University and an MA in Spanish from the University of St Andrews and a PhD in history from the University of Cambridge. But first, let's hear from Margaret Cameron Ash, the author of two books that expose how little we'd known up to now about the British government's decision to establish a colony in New South Wales and how much of our understanding of that has been clouded by prejudice. Tellingly, Margaret trained as a lawyer rather than a historian. The story she writes is based on evidence rather than hearsay or innuendo. Margaret, your latest book, Beating France to Botany Bay, The Race to Found Australia, released just before Christmas, is already in its second print run. Uh, can you start by telling us perhaps, uh, giving us a, a summary of the book and what you say that is new and important? Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's nice to be here, trust me, uh, all the way from Sydney. What's, what's left of it? Uh, now, uh, we, all, we all like a good backstory, and this is what I try to tell in the book. The book is about two things. It's about the bombshell that triggered the scrambling of the First Fleet in 1786 and the race between Arthur Philip and La Perouse. So why was the First Fleet sent? As Geoffrey Blaney writes in The Tyranny of Distance, it was simply vital that France should not be allowed to occupy such a strategic site. But were the French really interested in occupying New Holland in the late 18th century? Well, yes, they were. France had just lost the Seven Years' War, and with it, it had lost almost its entire Northern Hemisphere empire, including Canada. Now, the smartest man on the block was Louis Bougainville. He won the backing of Louis XV, to start up a, an empire in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, the first thing he did was colonize the Falklands uh, with some French Canadian uh, refugees. Uh, that um, uh, Britain has seen that that got written out of history a little bit, but um, I go into it quite a lot in my first book. Uh, after that, uh, Bougainville circumnavigated the globe uh, with instructions to certainly go to Australia, and if he uh, found uh, anything that was of particular use, either to trade or navigation, he was to take possession of it. Uh, so he island hopped uh, from east to west across the Pacific, and he took, he took possession of about seven places, 
and he would have taken possession of New Holland two years before Cook did, uh, uh, except he was blocked by the Cape, uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, he was, in fact, ordered to go to 40 degrees south, but uh, he didn't. Uh, now, after Bougainville had got home, uh, the, the uh, British government was uh, uh, realised it had been caught napping, and it was now on high alert. So it, uh, the Admiralty sent Cook on his three voyages, and he discovered a lot of things, uh, and he told the Admiralty about all of them, and he told his journal only about some of them, uh, because he didn't want the French to read about them. Uh, now, then came uh, the American War, the Revolutionary War, and that preoccupied everyone. And meanwhile, Joseph Banks uh, was very worried that France could grab Cook's discoveries. Uh, he pushed for the colonisation of uh, at, at two parliamentary inquiries, uh, which the inquiries were all about the convicts, which was not, uh, he, he wasn't interested in penal reform, but he was interested in having a bunch of occupiers. Uh, but he failed on both accounts. He was thrown out of court, uh, partly because of the cost and partly because of the veto of the East India Company. Uh, there was no way the East India Company was going to allow a government-run organisation in its monopoly zone. So Botany Bay was consigned, consigned to the dustbin, never to be mentioned again. Then seven months after the second inquiry, quite suddenly, on 17th of August, 1786, Joseph Banks met an American, John Ledyard of Connecticut, uh, who had just arrived from Paris, where he was very good friends with the USM ambassador there, Thomas Jefferson. Now, Jefferson was very nervous about La Perouse's uh, voyage, which was then uh, getting packed up and was underway and getting going. And so he sent his friend, um, he, but the reason he was upset uh, was because he thought the French might be planning uh, colonies on his west coast. He didn't actually own it yet, but he had um, imaginings. And uh, so he sent uh, John Paul Jones to where the ships were getting uh, prepared and said, find out what's going on. Uh, Jones uh, eventually wrote him a letter, said, well, they are, they've, they've got uh, 40 uh, farmers aboard, they've got lots of agricultural equipment, they've got heaps of trees and plants and wonderful things happening, and um, they're going to make colonies in New Holland. And that put... Uh, Jefferson's mind at rest and th therefore the uh, matter would have died because they had no reason to tell the British or anyone else this. Um, and, but then uh, Ledyard, who had been with uh, uh, Jefferson hearing all this information, just happened to be uh, recruited by the Marquis of Buckingham, William Pitt's first cousin, uh, to uh, front a gun-running operation to Venezuela so that the um, uh, colonists there could free themselves from Madrid. It was very fashionable at the time. And uh, so he was called to uh, London. He borrowed some money from Jefferson and Jefferson gave him a passport on the 7th of August, 1786, raced across the Channel, uh, bought himself two dogs, a tomahawk and a peace pipe, as you would if you were going on a long journey. And uh, he uh, then met uh, J Joseph Banks on Thursday the 17th of August. Now you're all getting very excited because you know that the 18th of August was the magic day when the decision to colonise Australia was made. So we're back on the Thursday, on the 17th. Now, Cook and Ledyard uh, both wanted to meet each other. They were both members of the Cook alumni. Uh, Joseph Banks had sailed on the first voyage. Ledyard had sailed on the third voyage. 
And so they were very pleased to meet each other, presumably at Soho Square, uh, where Joseph Banks had his city house. And uh, in the course of this, uh, Ledyard, who was quite a show-off, uh, boasted about his uh, relations with um, Thomas Jefferson and, and so on. Uh, he happened to mention, uh, where they got onto the subject of La Perouse, who's, who was just casting off, ready to go, and what do you know about this and what do you know about that? And of course, Ledyard told him or recited John Paul Jones's letter to him. Well, of course, Banks was dumbfounded at this, uh, but he was also thrilled because this was the very evidence that he wanted if he was going to get the British government to move. So he ushered uh, Ledyard out of his uh, front door and raced over to Whitehall, told Pitt. Pitt uh, summoned a cabinet meeting for the following day and the decision was made. And so the British were off and racing and in due course they appointed Arthur Philip to uh, lead the first fleet. So what were the French doing? Well, they had been in the uh, Pacific for about a year uh, and when the French government realised that Britain was serious about this, the minister in Paris wrote a new set of instructions to La Perouse, sent them to Moscow and then by courier across Siberia to Kamchatka on Russia's far east. Nine months later, miraculously, uh, La Perouse was there to receive them. He'd put in for a bit of a fit out in one thing and another and he was just, the governor, the Russian governor was giving him a farewell ball uh, in Kamchatka and suddenly the courier burst through the ballroom doors and handed him this new dispatch which told him to forget his agenda and just go straight to Botany Bay, which he did almost. Uh, and meanwhile, the first fleet had just left Rio, was crossing to uh, Cape Town. Uh, out of Cape Town, Philip transferred from the Sirius to the Supply uh, because a uh, tiny little ship, but much quicker. Uh, the Supply got to Botany Bay on the 18th of January, 1788. And the 10 other ships miraculously arrived within the next 40 hours. Uh, now, Bondi, uh, Botany Bay was uh, just a rendezvous point, and, uh, which uh, Philip knew, of course. Uh, that's because when Cook, 16, uh, 18 years before, had been in Botany Bay, he'd realised that it was of no value, it's too shallow. He walked north and saw Sydney Harbour from the shores, from, from the ridge around. And uh, that meant that he, he never took the endeavour, in, when they left Botany Bay and sailed north, they never, he never took the endeavour into the harbour uh, because he didn't want his men to see it. Uh, but that meant that the, uh, the first fleet couldn't go straight there because the entrance had never been sounded and you couldn't take uh, 1,500 people onto a sand sandbank. So uh, as soon as the, three, uh, the 10, 11 ships were anchored, he, uh, Philip took three boats, raced up to make a survey of Port Jackson, sounded the entrance, found Sydney Cove and raced back. Uh, meanwhile, and, and told you know, to, to gather the first fleet to go to uh, Port Jackson. Meanwhile, the French had uh, come, circled um, uh, Norfolk Island, and sighted the east coast at Broken Bay, which is just north of Port Jackson. Uh, La Perouse had Cook's map spread out before him, and he said, uh, well, he, he knew he had to turn south. Extraordinarily, he passed on the 23rd of January, uh, 1788, just as the British were coming in their three little boats having made their survey, he passed by Sydney Heads, and if he was tempted to enter that harbour, he uh, did not yield to them to their temptation. He'd been told to go to Botany Bay, and so he kept going south. Now, what uh, 
the next day, the 24th of January, the weather turned and uh, Sydney had a Sydney storm. Lots of uh, lightning and thunder and rain and wind. Uh, so no one could do anything. The French put their noses into the entrance of Botany Bay on that morning, but couldn't do anything. And fortunately, they decided to go off the coast for safety, and so they disappeared for the next two days. On the 25th, Philip was determined to get out. Um, the rest of the ship, they all tried. They couldn't do it. Philip made three attempts, and finally, in the afternoon, he got out in the supply, went up, and uh, through all that storm, very brave, that storm and electrical activity, put into Sydney Cove and just stayed there the night by uh, himself with, uh, on the supply. 26th of January, it was up to Hunter, John Hunter now, to get the fleet out. Um, they were, they'd raised their anchors, they were going out and blow me down, they were the French ships again. So they, uh, the French were coming in and were mystified to see the British racing for the exit. Uh, La Perouse was very disappointed. They'd been at sea for two years. They wanted some decent conversation. But anyway, that, um, they raced out. The French came in and uh, set, set their anchors. The British were racing out. Uh, the entrance, they crashed into each other, caused quite a lot of damage. Um, but nonetheless, they got out, got up, and they got around to uh, uh, Sydney Cove uh, by sunset. And you all know that painting with the flagpole and they're toasting and they're, they're toasting for Thanksgiving for a safe voyage and uh, for beating the French by five days. Thank you. So my take out from that is that what I understood for many, many years to be the reason the British settled uh, Botany Bay or, or settled in Sydney Harbour to fa would, and that reason was to found a penal colony so that they had somewhere to put the, the various felons and riffraff that they used to send to America but they couldn't after the War of Independence. The idea that that was the catalyst for settlement is completely and utterly wrong. Is that right? Uh, yes, um, it is wrong because the, the convicts had already been catered for. At that first inquiry I mentioned, the Bunbury inquiry, inquiry in 1779, uh, the uh, prison reformers won that. Banks lost and the prison reformers won. The uh, transportation was going to be cancelled. Uh, the prisoners were going to be put in penitentiaries. A sort of club med environment whereby they were going to repent and become useful citizens for England. Uh, they bought the land uh, at, at Battersea Rise uh, from Lord Spencer, Princess Diana's forebear. Uh, they had the architectural competition for the uh, prisons or penitentiaries. They passed the Penitentiary Act. <coughs> uh, time dragged and people lost the political will, but the problem was solved. That's the point. The, the uh, uh, convicts were not really a problem. They, you, what you did to get rid of convicts, you uh, gave them a pardon if they joined the army. They, they, it was soluble. They didn't need to go to Botany Bay, but they were very, very valuable because they provided an occup occupying force, they provided cheap labour, and that, of course, is what saved us from slavery. So, yes, they were good. So, uh, and of course the other point you draw out in there is that um, it was the idea of founding a colony purely as a penal settlement was ruled out because of expense. I think there's a reason why we forget that these days. We, we think that expense doesn't matter to government so they can pay for whatever they want. But uh, back then in that period, after the long war against France, after the war against independence, uh, under under George III, a much much maligned um, and much underestimated monarch, Britain was going through a, a period of what we'd now call fiscal consolidation. Right, money did matter. They weren't going to spend money on this for no reason whatsoever. That's right. That's right. No, that's right. And of course, the other feature was the East India Company, which uh, didn't want anyone, any English uh, 
operation in its um, uh, monopoly area, which was the entire Indian and Pacific Oceans, really. Um, the, uh, they uh, were eventually put upon, uh, after the decision was made, uh, they said, oh, OK, um, because they didn't really want the French there either. Uh, but they said, um, it'll be at a price. You won't be able to make, uh, ma build any boats because we don't want you trading uh, in your own right. Um, at school, you're often told that that's because they didn't want the convicts to escape, but it wasn't. It was to prevent trade from Australia. When I first read it, I thought, well, maybe it's just me. I'm, I'm a POM, what would I know? I've only been here 33 years, you know. Um, you know, maybe I've missed something, but when I read... So I went back and looked at Manning Clark's uh, History of Australia. I looked at the first volume that covers his period, and there is no mention whatsoever of the French fleet in there, none whatsoever, the, and no, let alone a hint that this was a strategic settlement. Um, the other book that was highly influential at the time I came to Australia was Robert Hughes, The Fatal Shore, which is, his narrative is entirely about the penal settlement. No mention at all that this was a strategic decision, a military decision almost. So the big, the big question is, how come it's taking us so long to really start getting to the, the heart of this story? Is it because we've been careless about our history or was there something else going on? Uh, look, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, for, my, for myself, I, it, was, it started me off about 30 years ago when I was working in London and uh, an old codger at the sailing club said, oh, you're Australian, are you? Well, I... Um, I have sailed in many a uh, Sydney to Hobart, and for the life of me, I can't understand why Captain Cook didn't know he was in Bass Strait when he was in Bass Strait. And um, it, it sort of rolled from there, and I, I just kept finding holes in the story. And as you say, I, I don't know why other people didn't see holes in the story, because it it is a silly idea of sending uh, a bunch of... Uh, petty thieves uh, uh, to the other side of the globe. I mean, Kennedy should have um, sent a bunch of uh, shoplifters to the moon. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, there is a thing called expense, and uh, this, was, this was one of them. Well, let me put that question to Bella. So, Bella, um, you, you, you study, one of your roles is to look at at the teaching of history and of culture in, in our universities and schools. Why is it that we're getting to something... I mean, often we talk, don't we, about the ideological element to this, this, this sort of bias that people have because of their ideological uh, fixation on some utopian idea. But, but this goes beyond this to me. This is just that we haven't really got to the facts. We haven't really interrogated our history strongly enough and, and, and just to discover actually what goes on, let alone what gloss you put over it, what went on. Is that unique to Australia or I mean, would it be true, say, of, of Spain or France or the United States? Is Australia particularly bad at looking at its own history? Um, well, I'm, my, my field of, is, of history is, is really Spanish history and, and a little bit of English history as well. Um, but I couldn't believe, after, I mean, this is a brilliant book, and I couldn't believe I didn't know this. I couldn't believe that I'd got to the ripe old age of... Um, 24. 27. Um, and, and, and got through the school system and, and didn't know that the French, that we missed, that, that there was this, it was so close. And that not only was it close, but the French and the English spent three months on each other's boats having incredible... Um, incredibly enjoyable evenings drinking Madeira port and eating um, a sort of potted potted pheasant and I mean I don't know how they got hold of these things but I mean this is this is incredible history in the the, the, the scene where um, Philip sends two horses by boat over to La Perouse and La Perouse and one of his men uh, rode along Frenchman's path and and dined for the first time in I mean this is incredible history and how how do we not know this and this is such a basic and most important aspect of our history, and we didn't we didn't know it. Um, 
It's not surprising, though, that it's not taught to Australian children now. Most people in this room are members of the IPA, so they've been following our work on the national curriculum. Um, it doesn't come as a surprise to, to, to us all that this is not mentioned, but nothing else really is either, unless it's deep time Aboriginal history or um, uh, the 1960s uh, sort of civil rights movement, um, which is pretty much all Australian children are taught these days. Uh, even when I was at school, I think I remember, I have a vague memory of Australian history, 20th century political history, but, but not much else. And I don't know if it's, um, wasn't, it hasn't been considered important enough or there's been other, people have been concentrating on other things. I mean, Australia was a very difficult country to settle. It was all about survival. Perhaps, perhaps the idea of studying our history took, took, a, took a, back, a back seat. But I, I don't think we're very good at it. Um, and I wish that every school in Australia had a copy of this book. And, and I wish there was a, um, a version for primary schools, because I was reading the primary school curriculum this morning, and um, um, they, they get taught that very boring version of the First Fleet, and the, the, the version that doesn't make sense. That for some reason, <laughs> the English decided to send petty thieves out and across to the other side of the world, even though um, it, they didn't need to. So yes, I think, I think we need to do our history a lot better. And that, I think you make a good point. I mean, I think writing a, an edition of this for children uh, 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 would be a very good project, maybe the sort of thing the IPA supporters would want to sponsor. Um, but, you know, let's, let's be fair. Let's not make sweeping statements here. As you point out in this, and, and nobody will be very surprised at this, the great Geoffrey Blaney spotted some time ago that there was something wrong about that. The narrative, the you know the penal quality narrative in uh, in the tyranny of distance, which I think was 1971, he, he asked the question, what was the catalyst? Because he he realised that it couldn't have been just purely a penal colony, didn't he? That's right. Well, he did. He, he said it was uh, yes, it was just too costly, uh, the whole thing, because of not only the initial cost, of course, but uh, the whole place had to be maintained by Britain for 40 or 50 years before it became. Uh, self-supporting, uh, but you're right. I think I think the kids, uh, British British children, are not taught to be ashamed of the Battle of Trafalgar, and I don't think our children should be taught to be ashamed of the Battle of Port Jackson because it was another victory over the French, poor souls. You know, <laughs> I I think it's I think it's um, it's just an exciting story. It's lot, got lots of daring do and bravery and stuff ups and, and it, it's it's a terrific story and the kids would sit up in their seats uh, just for the fun of it you know and, uh, and and in your first book lying for the admiralty you you you, you know you put forward another idea that that um, and this should come no surprise if we're talking about britain's strategic interests they didn't exactly uh, broadcast them from the rooftops. I mean, they, they, they kept their, their cards close to their chest, right? And, and the big example of this, I think, possibly the oldest example of fake news that I've discovered that has survived for centuries, uh, was the idea that they planned to settle in Botany Bay. You know, that was always the story. Botany Bay was where they were heading. But I think you suggest in this book and your previous book that right the time from Captain Cook's arrival, um, in Australia, they knew that Sydney Harbour was the place to be, and that's where they would eventually settle, even though they went to Botany Bay the first when they first came here. Is that right? Oh, I think so. Uh, well, Botany Bay was the place that Cook had sounded. He had gone there uh, just by fate. It was extraordinary that he did choose sort of the worst harbour in the country, uh, sort of just 10 miles away from the best harbour of the country. But he parked his ships there, and that's all the men saw. But he and a couple of trusted fellows went over, saw a naval paradise, and uh, knew that they couldn't say or do anything about it, um, and just came back, bypassed it, and went home. But uh, the, what he very cleverly did also, and I'm not the first person to say this, H.B. Carter, the biographer of Banks, says it's extraordinary that they all just constantly, all you read about is Botany Bay. The name Botany Bay became synonymous in Europe with the word Australia. Where are you going? I'm not going to Australia, I'm going to Botany Bay. The, um, and yet Banks himself had seen the rich Illawarra Plain below Botany Bay, and of course Cook had seen the harbour above. And 
that they, they, it was like the wooden horse of Troy, it was a decoy, just concentrate on Botany Bay, which if any Frenchman idly passed, they'd say, oh, that's no good, so they'd go away. And it was, it was a very good decoy, and uh, it was also the rendezvous point, because it had been sounded, of course, but it was a very good decoy, and it proved its, its uh, worth in gold when La Perouse sailed past it. That was extraordinary, and uh, he must be kicking himself. Yes. Yeah, I've had um, British relatives come here, and they say, we want to go to Botany Bay, and I say, why? And I guess <laughs> It's, it, it, when you go there, you think, well, it was never going to be the place they settled. It doesn't mm. look that way, does it? No. Uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you a bit more of a philosophical question here. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? You can see in the United States at the moment there is a big argument going on about the foundational story, you know, whether it was the, uh, the noble story of, you know, persecuted religious people going to America to found a new colony under difficult circumstances, or whether it was, um, you know, slave-owning hell. Um, does it matter, therefore, is it important that we actually get this story right, and why? Look, I think it's very important. Oh, sorry. No, no, you, you go. No, <laughs> sorry, I think it's important to get it right. But, um, yes, no, I'll, I'll let you take over, Bella. Well, no, I agree. Look, it, it is the most important thing to get right, um, because it explains what we are as a nation, it explains who we are, where we've come from, and where we're going, and how to, how to, to be as, as a nation, as, as a citizen of Australia. Um, and at the moment, of course, the problem is that Australian children are told that Australia is a country that they need to be ashamed of, um, and they need to endlessly apologise for it, because it, it was born from invasion, uh, genocide, dispossession, um, you know, all the, all the horror of, of, of colonialism, um, disease. Uh, we hear nothing positive at all, and this is being um, written in deliberately to the national curriculum by people who I think actually believe that. Um, and they are forming the way uh, future generations of Australians see themselves. And of course, this goes to um, the current situation, uh, one of the conversations that has been uh, floating around the theoretical um, sort of question about, well, what would Australians do if we were invaded? Uh, this has come up in the last uh, few days, given the situation in Ukraine. And a lot of people are saying there's a, there's a strong possibility that, that the younger cohort might not want to defend Australia because they don't believe Australia is worth defending. And this comes directly from their, uh, I, I wouldn't call it an education, I would call it indoctrination. They're indoctrinated from the moment they start primary school to the moment they leave to believe that Australia is, 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 is a country that really um, is, is, is a racist country that they should be ashamed of. So, so the foundation story is absolutely everything. It, it's, um, you know, I was thinking about it myself. I was thinking if I'd been taught that, that Australia is racist, how would I feel as an individual? And I, I would feel embarrassed and I would be one of those people out there marching, marching for justice or, or whatever they do. Um, and, and I would feel, I would feel um, doubts about whether it is worth defending. And I think this is, our, this is the main problem at the moment. And this is why we have to do as much as we can about, about correcting the balance um, and this is what um, former education minister Alan Tudge was saying. All he said is that we need some balance in history curriculum. We don't need to. We don't need to get rid of the. We don't need to get rid of the the bad things that have happened in our history. But we do need to add in the positives. And one of the positives, and the most positive thing, is that we are the product of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment was about progress and hope and innovation. And um, and they weren't just Enlightenment men theoretically. They actually introduced practically the Enlightenment, and Australian children have no idea why we have equality, why we have freedom of speech. They, they don't, and there's a huge disconnect. So in the classroom, they hear that this country is a terrible place, but they go out into the street, and it's actually not that bad. Um, so so this, is, this is the problem, and, and this is why I really think this book needs to be to taught, and this needs to be part of the curriculum. And look, don't we have to fight this word colonialism? I think we have to fight almost any word with ism on the end. But, you know, I mean, colonialism is a new word, right? It, it's, it, it's 
to set up the idea in our heads that this was some kind of pernicious ideology from the start, whereas it wasn't. It was, it was the practical way of, well, doing all sorts of things. In some cases it was trade, in other cases it was strategic. A whole lot of reasons why colonies happened. But don't we have to actually make a distinction between colonies? I mean, that there's a big difference. It makes a big difference to you as a colonised people as to whether you're colonised by the Belgians or the British. Yes, well, one of the books that we read in our book club last year was Heart of Darkness, and it certainly um, everyone should read that and be very grateful that it wasn't the Belgians who beat the French by, by 10 minutes to, to Botany Bay, because it would have been a very different place. Um, and, and it would have been a different place precisely because the British brought with them um, the rule of law, quality before the, the, before the law, or these wonderful institutions that have made us the, the, the great nation that, that we still are today, um, despite the last two years of, um, of interesting politics. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's look, we're, we're, and this is something that children need to be taught. We should be lucky that it was the British who arrived. You should be thankful that it was the British who arrived here in 1788. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Look, you raise another point, Margaret, that your, your book is actually interesting, it's actually exciting, it's a great narrative, it's a sort of stirring and um, uh, um, encouraging narrative. It's very different from the sort of black armband, hand-wringing sort of history that we're taught. I mean, it would be actually good for children to be taught a story, well, the, not only because it's the real story, but because it's a story that uh, it goes to the importance of courage and... Um, an enterprise and commitment, doesn't it? Yes, it, I, I, I am just a, a one-trick pony. I, I, I only talk about the Anglo-French angle of it. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't enter into any of those other threads of Australian history. And I, I don't think it, as Bella says, I don't think it should replace them. But I think it should, the Anglo-French story should be there because Without it, we're just swimming around. We think that uh, sort of the Flying Dutchman came over the horizon and bingo, we're all here. It was nothing like that. There was a, a very real uh, historic reason in, in, the, in the late, very exciting late 18th century. And, and this was a British victory. What happened after that is sort of somewhat disconnected from that in a way, although it, it did, of course, as you say, bring the Enlightenment and a lot of thought was given into whether... Philip, Philip was, in fact, initially given a military commission and over Christmas, uh, uh, Lord Sidney decided, no, that's not going to work for the greater good. Uh, so he was given a civil commission with um, a fully-fledged uh, English common law uh, arrangement just placed in uh, Sydney Cove from the minute the, the fleet got going. And, and indeed, the first uh, civil case, as Bella mentioned, it was the, uh, a lost luggage case some convicts uh, sued the captain of the ship and said, you've lost my luggage, and they won 15 pounds. And that was the, the first six months of the settlement. <laughs> that was, yes, that was within six months of settlement. And, um, and it was also a case where uh, the convicts in Britain wouldn't have had the right to do that. They lost their rights to go to court, uh, but not so here. We're better. One, one thing... Um that I don't know you fully answer in the book, maybe you could have a go now. So it's a remarkable thing, isn't it, when you think about it, that, that having planted the flag there in Sydney Cove, uh, Britain went on to take possession of the entire continent from there on with very little competition, really. I mean, why, why didn't the French sort of say, oh, well, you know, shrug their shoulders as the French do, OK, we've missed out on, you know, the best bloody harbour in the world, but... We could go down to Melbourne and we could build little lanes with nice cafes and restaurants. And uh, well, Why didn't that happen? Why did the French just say, well, give up at that point? Well, well no, they, uh, they didn't really give up. In their French way, they kept on coming. They were coming for years and years, roaming around the shores. And every governor who heard about a French ship coming got the absolute willies. And he rushed off and planted 
a colony uh, in the middle of nowhere. He, they even uh, planted a colony in Albany before uh, Britain had taken the, the uh, western half of Australia. So, and, and he said, what, what I, the captain of the ship said, what will I do if the French arrive? I said, well, just tell them that we're here anyway, so go away. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, it was ring-fenced. It was ring-fenced all around from Hobart to Albany to uh, uh, up north near Darwin, and, and finally it did. But the French, they did have, keep having a go, uh, but they, they just couldn't get it right, as, as a friend said to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, in the 18th century, the French produced the Diderot's wonderful encyclopedia, while the English produced the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and it, yes, it's, it's the, the, the French had the thoughts about, they had the thoughts about Australia before the English did, but when it came to execution, it was the Brits that executed. I did get the impression from the book, actually, that they made the wrong decision. They kept making the wrong decisions. The French made mm. at every at the just when it come, mm. just when it they needed to write them make the right decision. They did the wrong mm. thing and just missed out every time. Um, yes, and also sure. they had they were bringing the wrong enlightenment with them. I mean we have to acknowledge that they were they they were not bringing the Scottish or the English enlightenment <laughs> with them. So um, my one of my favourite bits in the book was um, one of La Perouse's uh, close close um, uh, crew members. They were attacked by the Samoans, is that right? They were attacked by Samoans on the way and um, they were having a lovely dinner over at the campfire the night before and this chap was expounding the Rousseauian um, idea of the noble savage and saying, actually, they're better than us. Um, and the next day he was killed by one of them. So um, it's not funny, but it was, it was actually uh, uh, significant enough for La Perouse to write in his diary. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. A, he's not, he wasn't a fan of Rousseau, so I, I thought it was interesting. Again, we could have had we could have had Western Australia as French Enlightenment, mm. and we could have had the rest of the country as the as the, as the other Enlightenment. It would have been a very interesting historical experiment to see how that that would have gone. Please give us some further explanation of your of the two Enlightenments. Why was the British Enlightenment? What was special about it? What was different between the British Enlightenment and the French Enlightenment that made it? I guess a more a more effect, more practically more effective in, in terms of its outcomes, in terms of science, development of science, technology, etc. Well, I think it's it's summarised with the encyclopedists. They were the I mean, first of all, they were they were um, fanatically anti-Christian. Um, so the 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 French Enlightenment was 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 focused on um, dismantling the the uh, the Christian foundations of France and replacing it with something else. Um, and uh, that didn't go down so well as we saw in the French Revolution. I mean, the French Revolution is evidence enough of, of what was wrong with the French Enlightenment. Um, so I probably answered my own question about what Western Australia would have been had it been <laughs> a product of the French Enlightenment. Um, and of course, the, the, the Scottish um, Enlightenment was, was all about the scientific progress and, and, and um, less fanatical, shall we say. But again, it's not my field of expertise. Um, it's probably something that Margaret can, can expound on. You do, though, have mentioned in the book, you talk, you talk about the importance of the, um, of the religious uh, element of the settlement, that, that they, you know, the decision was made. It was a very, first of all, it was the, the first fleet was a very well-planned operation. Uh, but part of that planning, and it was very conscious, was that they needed to bring a a, a minister with them. Oh yes, yes. They chose Richard Johnson quite early in the piece uh, to come. Uh, what what they saw in religion was, it was not that they were all born again Christians or anything. It was they they saw the uh, rhythm. Of, of the Christian year and the rhythm of the weekly service and so on, uh, all helped bring uh, uh, the security, the confidence, and uh, a, a stronger settlement. All these, uh, they celebrated the king's birthday and all that sort of thing, not because they wanted to raise the flag so much as to have uh, a, a proper uh, rhythm to the year, rhythm to the week, where people would feel at home 
and could get on with their lives. And uh, the church played a very large part in that. And Philip was, was ordered to put on a, a weekly church, or ask Johnson to put on a weekly church service and that sort of thing. I don't think any of them were too hugely religious, these convicts, but I think it was good that um, they, they did provide that uh, regularity. One of, the, um, one of the reasons why the fleet was delayed, as, as you note in the book, possibly one of the earliest examples of, um, of, of gender balance. They realised when they looked at the list of convicts that they were almost all blokes and they had to do something about that, right? That was part of the planned yes. settlement. But they chose the colonists, the, they chose the... Um, the, the, they chose their prisoners well, didn't they? They didn't just pick the first thousand off the street. Uh, they, they certainly did make an effort to uh, make them young and strong and, and so on. There are a few mistakes uh, and uh, one or two very elderly ones and a couple of very young ones. But yes, they were all a pretty young uh, group of people who uh, could survive because that was the main deal at the time. Hmm. We've said, we all agree, I'm sure everybody in this room agrees, we need to teach this in schools. How, 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 in practical terms, how do we set about that? How do we start this process, Bella? Um, that's a very good and um, challenging question. We actually have started the process, um, so we have written quite a number of curriculum at the IPA which have been sent out to all the schools. So actually we did one on the Eureka Stockade, um, on the cable case, the first, the first civil law case that Margaret referred to that took place six months after they landed with no buildings, just a tent. Um, and, um, and there you go, you have the rule of law, you don't need buildings to, to, to enforce it. Um, and we made a film about um, the Magna Carta and we've also made a film about the... Um, what does Western civilization mean for for you? It's it's a it's a general Western civ course which which we've sent to every secondary school in Australia. So we've written um, four curriculum and we've sent them out to all the schools and they are being downloaded and used. So that is an excellent start, if I may say so myself. Not wanting to to blow the IPA's trumpet too loudly, but um, look, no one else is doing it, so we have to. Um, I get a lot of positive feedback um, from, from, from parents um, and it's really, you know, we can do a certain amount but it's really down to parents to, to first of all, to work to, to really get to grips with what your child is being taught. And that's fairly easy because you can go on the internet and look at the national curriculum. It's a, it's a big document but if you're particularly interested in one subject you can, you can go to the, the course and you can see what they're learning and you can ask your children when they get home from school and you can set them straight <laughs> when they get home from school, probably every day. It's, it's, it's quite a job. But, you know, we, we, we can make a difference and we are making a difference. And as you said, that would be a, just a magnificent um, curriculum to do this. And it could fit in with the national curriculum quite easily. So I think that's something that I might be talking to Margaret about in the next few months. Um, so, so, yes, there, there are things, but I think it's in the end it's down to parents um, and talk to the teachers, talk to the principals and find out what their children are learning. I suspect that one of the one of the one of the pushbacks is going to be about this is a, you know you don't look in your book uh, at the indigenous element of this do you you don't get too involved in that story. No, it's it's not my expertise uh, at all. I I haven't looked at a lot of people have. Um, there there are some quite good books on. Uh, where people, uh, historians have tried to imagine what it would have been like uh, for the indigenous people. Um, I, I don't go there at all. I'm, I'm not equipped to do so. And uh, the books that do talk about the, uh, the convicts or the, the aborigines or the environment or whatever it might be, none of them talk about the Anglo-French. So I just thought I'd talk about the Anglo-French. Yes. I mean, you do you to to, the, to this extent. You you do you do cover it in that you talk about the motivation of people like Banks and, and others who are great enthusiasts for the Australian colony and and their thinking because they did think, didn't they? About they thought quite deeply about how they would um, 
accommodate, if you like, the indigenous population, how they would, how, how they would treat them, how they would deal with them when they came out? Oh, yes. Philip, Philip had some very specific instructions. Um, there was to be no injury to the indigenous people. They, uh, they would, uh, above all, they weren't to be contaminated by the low life that the British were bringing. Um, they, were, they were to be kept separate from the um, convicts and the sailors. Uh, and uh, there was, the idea was that they would keep on running their own lives according to their own rules and regulations, their own uh, systems, uh, and the two could coexist. Uh, they were particularly concerned about uh, the Aboriginal women. They, they were, uh, intermarriage was, would be allowed, uh, but if any Aboriginal woman was hurt, uh, or in any way, um, the uh, man concerned would be sent off to some island off the coast and perish there. So th they were concerned about the Aborigines, yes. And the, the court system was important, wasn't it? That they made they made decision that there would be civil law imposed from the very day they landed. It wouldn't be under military law. That's right, yes. And why was that important? Uh, it was, uh, you can't have free people under military rule. And of course, there were a lot of free people. Half the First Fleet was free. It would, there were a lot of women, the Marine, 30 wives, uh, Marine wives came. Uh, lots, of baby, lots of babies were born on the, on the journey. Um, so there, there were a lot of free people anyway, and all the convicts were going to become free. Um, they, as soon as their sentence expired, which could be in one or two years, uh, depending how long ago they were convicted, um, so they would be free, and, and they shouldn't be made... Uh, it wouldn't work if it was under a military regime. See, Nick, these are the type of discussions they need to be happening in, having in the, in the school, in, in secondary school. Can you imagine how engaged these students would be if, if we could talk about this. But unfortunately, even having this discussion now is, is probably considered racist. Because, and it, it sounds like a joke, but the problem is the idea that anything, you know, it goes back to the idea of the, the, the way they've captured the word colonial, and that immediately is now associated with white racism and white supremacy. Um, and even discussing a book about um, the Anglo-French rivalry um, is, is, is not something that most teachers would want to go near now because, because of this um, influence of uh, identity politics and, and, and critical race theory in the classroom, which is much worse in America, but unfortunately it's coming here. I've found instances of it in the national curriculum. Um, so, so there's a blanket, there's, now there's just a blanket um, shutdown of all discussion of, of any of this history. Um, and this is the problem we're facing. And we've also got a fixed idea, haven't we, about the, the idea that the, the, the penal colony was a place primarily of punishment. You know, this is Robert Hughes's narrative in The Fatal Shore. Uh, it, it, it was Keith Winshuttle at Quadrant just said to me, oh, well, this was one of the earliest victimisation, vic victimhood uh, narratives that set in that these, col you know, that the... the the, uh, the people who were transported out here were just petty criminals and they were punished harshly by the British. That story is wrong too, isn't it? I and mean, we've got to get to the, you know, the, the, the difference between a British penal colony and a French penal colony, for instance, in the one in New Caledonia is Chalk and Cheap. That was a place, place of punishment. That was a place where you'd have your hand cut off if you stole some food. Whereas here, it was a place of redemption. We wanted these colonists to become good citizens and go on and, and, and get some land and farm and do positive things, didn't we? Yes, that, that's right. The, um, the punishment was transportation. After that, you had to serve out your sentence, but you did so ho hopefully with, with uh, not too much rigour. Um, but the where, the, where Port Arthur and those places came in was secondary punishment. If you misbehaved when you got here, you were punished. But pa the, the, uh, the only punishment in England was transportation, not, not cruelty. Yes, we've got two competing narratives then. So you've got the one that says that all the, the convicts were victims 
but they were white, and you've got the other narratives saying they were also oppressors. So <laughs> I don't know how they're going to reconcile that one. <laughs> but as if you're on the left, you can have two two thoughts at the same. You can hold two thoughts at the same time. So I suppose you, it works in, in in history as well. Yeah, I suppose even the Irish count as white, don't they? <laughs> um, there was. But, but this is look. This is this idea of redemption is is very important to me, and it goes to you know what you study the the our, our Judeo-Christian heritage that that every person is equal before God, and that everybody should be given a chance to redeem themselves, even if they've done the most heinous, terrible thing. That's that's crucial, isn't it, to the idea of Christian. Judeo-Christian thinking and and what makes this place so good because it doesn't matter what you do you can you have a chance to redeem yourself, which is of course um, being undermined by identity politics, which tells you that um, that you are um, part of a collective and you have to take on the guilt of that collective, and if you're white, um, you can never even assuage that guilt anymore. So it's it's gone past that, um, and that's that's the other problem with with this idea of um, of white supremacy and white guilt. Because um, it does completely undermine the the foundations of this country, the Judeo Christian foundation of the idea of individ individualism and individual sovereignty and and everything else. And of course, this is something else that they need to hear at school, and they're not they're not hearing. So, Margaret, you you've uncovered you've you've put a you've given us a completely fresh way of looking at at, at the first fleet about at, at looking at the first colony. Um, and you've done that by bringing to the fore facts that were either not looked at or not fully considered in their context. Now, there must surely be a lot else, even about that period. Let's, let's just stop at 1788, but even up that period, which we don't know. I mean, we, if, if you could be persuaded to do a follow-up book, and I think you're reluctant to do it, but if you could, where are you going to be looking for the next, the next element to this story? I suppose it's the early, early, early colonial period, but uh, oh, Nick, no, I'm going to take up croquet. <laughs> well, look, I think thank you very, very much indeed. We, we might uh, for, for, the, for the conversation. It's been most fascinating, and every time I talk to you, new elements come out which excite me about Australian history. So, Margaret Cameron Ash, thank you very much, and Bella, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, thank you all. That was. Um that was terrific, and uh, and we'll give a proper appreciation in just a, in just a moment, and and I'll also um, do some housekeeping. I might um, uh, I can't help it. I've got a microphone. Just my own reflection. Um, uh, Margaret's book is inspirational. Uh, Bella's work on the national curriculum simile is inspirational for me. It actually caused me to go looking into it uh, for something that is related, which is. Um, and I wrote about this in The Spectator on global citizenship. Um, and uh, the point being that how could a student with that kind of curriculum understand a great power rivalry? Because in schools, they're not taught about things like great power rivalries. They're taught about um, the need for global citizenship and just to leave all that kind of thing behind us, just as at the universities, uh, the study of international relations now, as it has been termed, rather than a study of geopolitics, as old, us old-fashioned types like to think of it, is it's the study of the world not as it is but as it should be. So how could they understand an Anglo-French rivalry? How could they understand the Anglo-German rivalry which led up to World War I, which John Moses uh, wrote, uh, provided a chapter in the IPA review about, how could they understand what's happening in the world right now? So that's why uh, it's been such a rewarding talk because it reflects on all those those, those things. Uh, Margaret, a special thank you to you for your wonderful book, for coming down to Melbourne. Um, glad you made it and you didn't have to uh, sail down in a, in a small ship uh, out, <laughs> out of the heads. Um, uh, Bella, thank you for your uh, work and your contribution and your appreciation. And uh, Nick, thank you for emceeing, for coming down also and, uh, uh, and for taking such a wonderful group of questions. Thank you. Please thank our, uh, our speakers today.